Good morning. Thanks for being here this morning. Um, this was cool. This was like one of the first times I think in a long time we just we sang just kind of hymns on a Sunday morning. Well, actually, there was a spiritual song in there. Anybody, anybody remember like hymns and spiritual songs? Anybody pick out the spiritual song in the four that we sang this morning? Yeah, it was love lifted me, right? So yeah, we always, we always struggle with that. Like, spiritual songs are just praise courses. No, not necessarily. They're just songs that we sing about life, right? Christian life. And so um, thanks for the group that last minute made some adjustments and helped out this morning. I know we, we did some last minute refiguring on who was singing and playing and all those kinds of things. So thanks for everybody the pitching in and helping out with that. Um, so this morning, I want to welcome you to the easiest place and the easiest day in the week to be a Christian. You're here. Yay, right? But today I'm going to talk to you about tomorrow. Um, and, and today I want us uh, to be encouraged to see how our Sunday should actually affect our Monday. And, 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 and I want us to, to lean in this morning and listen to the Apostle Paul as he reminds us that there's no distinction between sacred and secular in Christianity. There's no distinction between the two. And, and, and as far as our Christian lives go, right? So Paul's going to talk to us a little bit about the fact that there should be, for followers of Jesus, there should not be a difference between our work life and our faith life. Um, God doesn't see it that way. God doesn't see your work life as your work life and your faith life as your faith life. He sees your life, right? And so Paul's going to, he's going to press in on this um, a little bit uh, today. And so hopefully there's some things we can be challenged by and encouraged by. Um, over the past several weeks, or actually the last several months, I was looking back, we started this series in like May. I, like it's been a while. It's, we've been walking through um, uh, the, the book of Ephesians, but that's what we've been, uh, the last several months, we've been walking through Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and we bumped up against this theme, and I'm going to continue to kind of put it before you because I really do believe this is kind of the theme of the letter over and over again. We bump into this idea that it, it's about God's grace to us, and then it's about God's grace through us. Um, we never exhaust God's grace to us. We should never run out of reasons to reflect God's grace through us, right? And so Paul just kind of keeps pressing us towards that idea. So last week, we looked at the way God's grace should flow through us and impact our families, right? So Paul was talking about, hey, in your family life, this is what it looks like when God's grace is in you, and this is what it looks like as God's grace gets lived through you in your home and in your family life. And today, Paul's going to show us what it looks like for God's grace to flow through us and impact our work environment. So if you have a Bible, we'll have verses up here, but if you have a Bible and you want to follow along, Bible app, um, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to start with verse 5. But before we begin to read, let me just give you kind of a warning. Um, it's, the, the words are going to be a little strange that we start out with, right? And so um, I just wanted to give you a little heads up. Um, the wording may, may seem a little strange at first, at first, but Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5, we're going to just jump in this morning. Here's what it says. Slaves... And we're like, what? Obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. And I want us to press pause real quick here because I've heard people take this verse and somehow twist it around to make it seem or, or, or kind of propagate this idea that somehow this is God's divine endorsement on slavery. I've heard people kind of use this verse in a, in a weird way to somehow support slavery or whatever it is. I, I just want us to know that's not at all what's happening. Um, this is a really good example of why I always kind of tell us context matters, right? Like the 2020 rule. You guys have heard, if you've been here, you've heard me say 2020 rule. 2020 rule is read at least 20 verses before. If you can, try to read at least 20 verses after the verse you're, you're puzzled about and somehow gain some clarity as to what it is that's being talked about and what's the context and what's the setting and, and what does this all mean, right? So we can, we can just pull this verse out and go, wow, well, look, in God's word, he endorses slavery or whatever that may, that's, that's not at all what, what's happening in this. It's important to understand that the issue that Paul is writing about is not slavery, it's attitudes, it's attitudes. He's not even writing about slavery. He's writing about attitudes. He wasn't addressing the rightness or the wrongness of any given situation. What he's trying to address is the heart attitude in any of our situations. So he wasn't addressing the rightness or the wrongness of this situation. He was getting to the heart of anyone in any situation, right? I, I, I read this quote 
by John MacArthur, and I thought it was just kind of a, it kind of helped clarify this idea a little bit. Let me just share this with you. He, said, he writes, New Testament teaching does not focus on reforming and restructuring human systems, which are never the root cause, right? That's never the problem. The problem isn't the system. Here it is. That's never the root cause of human problems. The issue is always the heart, which when wicked will corrupt the best systems, and when, and when righteous will improve the worst. I thought that was a great statement, that, it, that a lot of times we get this idea of, well, you know, the, the problem is the system. The problem is people. The problem is people. The problem is the heart. Uh, he goes on to say, if men's hearts are not changed, they will always find ways to oppress others, regardless of whether or not there is actual slavery. I thought that was powerful. And it doesn't really matter what system we have in place. If men's hearts aren't changed, they're going to find a way to oppress other people, no matter what that is, if their hearts are not changed. So here's a side note, you guys, and I just thought it was interesting. Um, it's interesting to see that one of the most striking evidences of the difference that the gospel can make in a culture dominated in, in, by, by slavery, it, it, it kind of actually appears in the catacombs. In a typical ancient Roman cemetery, it's very common to find references to the deceased as either slave or freedmen. So if you were to look in the tombs in ancient Greece or ancient Rome, it's, it's normal to see either free or slave on their, on their tombstones or on, their, on, on kind of their, what they're encased in. But in the Christian tombs, there are only names along with an inscription of Christian hope with no reference as to whether that person was slave or free. I thought that was just really interesting, that, that was the, that's kind of the difference you can see the gospel make in a culture that was dominated or, or where slavery was really a way of life, that all of a sudden Christians quit seeing each other that way. They quit seeing each other as slave or free, and, and, and when they would pass on their, on their tombstones or in the, the, the devices in which they were encased, the inscription was positive towards Christian hope and no reference to slave or free. Here's an interesting thing, and, and, and it bears... It bears out in history. There are numerous cases in, in ancient Rome of slave owners turning to Christ and releasing their slaves. There's several occasions where thousands of slaves were released at one time, which was just amazing to see what the gospel did in the hearts and in the lives of people. This isn't really about slavery. This is about the heart of, of, of those of us that are in a position to work for a living, right? And so Paul talks to the slaves of that day the same way he would talk to the employees of our day. So if you're here and you work for somebody, Paul's talking to us. He's talking to those of us that work for someone. And what he said essentially was that the way that we conduct ourselves at work speaks louder than all the hours you spend at church. That's what Paul says. Paul's gonna say, hey, what you do at work matters a whole lot more than what you do at church. Because this is the easiest day to be a Christian. This is the easiest place to be a Christian. He's like, yeah, what really matters is what happens on Monday. What really, happen, what really matters is what happens as you press it out into the world. So in this verse and the three that follow, Paul spells out what it looks like for God's grace to flow through us as employees in the workplace. And, and what's interesting to me is what's, what's the first characteristic of a grace-filled employee? Obedience. Obedience. And, and here, we don't, like, all the employers are like, what? Like, no. Ugh. Yeah, here's the weird thing. We think as adults that we outgrow the obligation of obedience once we outgrow childhood. You don't. You just change who you answer to. You still answer to somebody, right? What's weird <laughs> is that word, obey, is the same word that Paul used in Ephesians 6.1 when he told the children to obey their parents. There's no difference in the wording, there's no difference in its meaning. So the idea is, as children are to obey their parents, you as an employee are to obey your boss. That's what he just said. And I know that's like, that's already cringeworthy, right? We're already like, oh man, this is Sunday and we gotta hear this. And, and yeah, that's what he says he, right away. As employees, we have simply exchanged one authority for another. Newsflash, and I know you guys know it, but it's good to be reminded we all answer to somebody. All of us. We all answer to someone. 
And so I know we know that intellectually. Sometimes it's just good to hear it again, just so we're reminded that we all answer to someone. Where we were once responsible to do what our parents required, we are now responsible to do what our bosses require. And we are to do it with respect and fear and sincerity. What does that mean? Honor, humility, honesty. Maybe those are some substitute words we could use there. We're to do it with, with honor towards that person that employed us. Toward, and, and humility toward them, as well as honesty, honesty. There should be integrity and generosity on the inside of us that is then witnessed on the outside of us, right? We're to work hard and pour ourselves into our jobs while treating our employees with respect. That's what Paul's kind of getting to. Like, work hard, pour yourself into what you've been hired to do, and in the process, treat your supervisor, treat your boss, treat that manager, whoever that is, with respect. So anybody already feeling some pushback? Anybody already kind of like, anybody there? Yeah, anybody shuffling through? Are you shuffling through your list of the, hey, I hear what you're saying, but what about... I, 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 I read this, and I had the same thought. Like, hey, I, I'm reading this, but what about... What about those times when my employer doesn't seem deserving of respect? What, what about those times when they're very disrespectful? We already hear, already hear an elderly Christian, a, a, a seasoned Christian, a veteran Christian going, yeah, 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 it doesn't matter. Yeah, we're, we'll get to that. What about all the dumb projects they have me doing or the ridiculous shifts they have me working or the crazy routes they have me driving that don't make any sense or do any good? What about those times when I'm pretty sure they don't know what they are doing and they sure don't appreciate all that I'm doing? What about all those times? Here it is, guys. As hard as this is to swallow in our I deserve better than this mindset, no loopholes, no outs to use in a difficult situation. Paul doesn't say, yeah, in that case, then you don't have to be respectful or honest or or humble. Yeah, in that case, he doesn't, it doesn't say that. Uh, What he does say and, and what he does do is he points us to a higher purpose and a better motivation. It's what he does. He, he takes us from, hey, I feel like I should have a verse that gets me out of obeying my boss. He says, no, you're not going to find that. That's not going to way God's going to give you. He's not going to roll with that. I'm going to give you a higher purpose. I'm going to give you a, a greater motivation. You see, in the secular world, people get respect when they deserve respect, right? Typically. People get cooperation when they, when they deserve cooperation. In God's economy, we're to give respect even if they don't deserve it. That's what he says. In God's economy, we work on a higher level. We're called to a higher level. We're called to a higher plane of conduct. So how do we do that, right? How do we honor our bosses when, when maybe they, it doesn't seem like they deserve it, right? We can do it when our true aim is not to please our bosses, but to please our God, right? Look what Paul says. He continues on. He says, try to please them most of the time. No? No, he says, try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. I, I can remember, like, in high school, I had a little part-time job. I worked in a, in a fast food uh, place, and, and it was amazing, like, how much work got done when the managers were walking the floor, and how much work stopped getting done when the managers got off the floor. Anybody? Yeah, it was, it's incredible. And Paul kind of says, yeah, don't just work hard when they're watching you. Don't, don't just do your job when they're watching. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart, he says. Work with enthusiasm. Wow, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. So Paul tells us that respecting our bosses and working enthusiastically is God's will for us. You ever struggle? Well, I just want to know what God's will is. Do you have a job? Work hard, work enthusiastically, respect your bosses. If you struggle with, I just want to know what God's will is, do your job and work hard and be respectful and be humble, right? Here's the thought, you guys, really quick. I just so, I know you get this. You can put two and two together, but I'm up here, so let's just point it out. When we don't do that, we're going against God's will for us. 
So when we don't respect our bosses, when we speak poorly of our bosses, when we don't work hard, we just go through the motions in our job, you just violated what God's will for you is. I don't know that that's going to go well. You know, like, man, God, I just want you to bless me in my job. And his reply is, are you doing your job? Respectfully, honorably, with humility, are you working enthusiastically? And I'm, I'll, I'll even, I'll, I'll, I think you can fake it sometimes. There's some days you may have to fake the enthusiasm. I don't know. But try. Why? Because ultimately you're working for God. That's what he's telling us, that ultimately you're working for him. Here's the thought, you guys. God has graced us with an opportunity to work. We must allow God's grace to flow through us when we do. It's more than just giving thanks this week. Tomorrow when you go to your job, you live thanks. And hopefully one of the things you give thanks for if you're employed on Thursday is you, you give God thanks for the fact that he's given you an opportunity to work. I mean, that's a, that's a blessing. I know sometimes you don't feel that way. And I know tomorrow morning, you may have to talk yourself all through this. I get it. I understand. But God's graced you with an opportunity to work, to have something that you can do and gain some fulfillment and, and, and meet some obligations and get the things in life that, that, that you need to, to, to live, right? All those kinds of things. So, so Paul's going to provide some additional co- encouragement to us in this next verse. I want you to listen to this because I thought this was awesome. He says, remember, and he's speaking to employees, right? People that work for other people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good that we do, whether we are slaves or free. So unlike the slaves of Paul's day, we as employees actually receive a paycheck, right? Those slaves didn't receive a paycheck. They, they typically got a place to live, some clothing, food, those kinds of things. But we receive a paycheck, which is typically spent quickly. And Paul says, I'm going to point you to something that's greater than the paycheck. It's an eternal reward that God promises to you if you work hard, if you work humbly, if you work respectfully, right? Remember, the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do. Did you ever think about, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, I, obviously in this role, I, I get it. that like, hey, one day I'm going to stand before Jesus, and I'm going to have to give an account for how I did my job, in a sense, of, of what he's called me to. But you guys are going to have to do the same thing. Because the only way you're going to know if he's going to give you a reward is he actually calls into question what you've done, whether it's good or not. And, and it's probably not measured on, your, on, on, on the end product. It's probably measured in the attitude of what you're doing and how you're doing it, right? I don't, I don't know that he's going to say, hey, you know, great, you know, this, I'm going to give you more reward because you, you, you busted, you know, a million dollars in sales this year. I don't think he's, I don't, I don't know that God has a flow chart and he's, I don't know that he's tracking that, but he's definitely tracking our hearts and our attitudes, right? Your employer may not appreciate everything you do. He or she may not even see everything you do, but God does. He sees it. And he promises that he will not forget your diligent and your wholehearted effort. That's what he's measuring. I don't know that he's measuring the the ultimate outcomes. I don't know that he's measuring all of those end things that we seem to get hung up about, you know, sales and and customers. and, And I don't know that he's measuring that, but he's definitely measuring our hearts. He's measuring our attitudes, right? So, so next, Paul's going to actually address masters or employees, right, in, in this scenario. So masters or employers, treat your slaves or treat your employees in the same way, right? So we were just told, hey, you need to be respectful, you need to be honorable, you need to have humility, you, you need to be honest. And Paul says, hey, if you're an employer, the same is required of you. You need to be respectful, you need to be honorable. And, and here's where, as, like, if we're an employer, we're like, well, does that let me off the hook if they're not? No, no, back up to the verses we just read previously. That doesn't let us off the hook if they're not honorable, if they're not respectful. That doesn't let us off the hook if we're employees, right? But this is speaking to those that are employers. In the same way, respectfully, honorably, treat your, your, your slaves. And then he says your employers, don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites, just because you found yourself in a position to oversee people, you're not favored over those that you're overseeing in God's eyes. You're all on the same level. He's all holding us, he's holding us all accountable, right? 
The same attitude that Paul asked for the employees to have toward their employers is the same attitude that Paul asked the employers to demonstrate toward their employees. And then he kind of takes it a step further, right? So he says, hey, I'm asking this of the people that work for you. I'm asking this of you. But there's one more thing I'm going to add to this. Don't threaten them. Do not threaten them. And and I thought this was, my, my grandfather used to use this expression when I, was, I used to hear him say this all the time, but I didn't quite understand what it meant until I got a little bit older. But he's, he used to say, you know what, you'll, you'll attract more flies with honey than you will with vinegar. And I'm like, why would we even want to attract flies? Like, I was always thinking, like, why is that a thing? Why would, why would we want to attract flies? But, but he, I know, you know, later I understood he had some wisdom in that. But let me just share with you, the book of Proverbs offers some, some fitting wisdom here as well. Proverbs says this, the generous will prosper those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. That fits in, in, in a setting for employers. That, that works. That, that wisdom certainly applies here. It's certainly applicable. Wise words bring many benefits. Hard work brings rewards. That's probably employee, employer, right? I love this one. Some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing, right? Hopefully, it makes all the sense in the world for employers to treat their employees with respect and kindness because typically, the attitude that you push out is the attitude you get back. So it makes all the sense in the world. If I'm I'm an employer, if I have people working for me, it makes all the sense in the world to have a positive attitude and to be respectful and to be humble and to be honorable and be honest because that's what I'm gonna want from them as well, right? Employers, like parents, stand in a position of power, but like parents, they're not there to control, they're there to guide. And hopefully, we, if you're in a position of management or, or you're an owner or, or whatever your role may be, if you have people working underneath you, I think God is speaking to us on this. Like, hey, you, you want the best from them, so give the best of yourself to them. And, and it's that, that idea, right? Why is it so important that employers treat their employees with respect? Like, why is that so important in God's view? Because there's no favorites. We're all going to give an account. We're all going to stand before God one day. Employees and employers are equal in God's eyes. One day we have to give account for attitudes and actions. I, I love the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases these verses that we've been reading this morning. And I thought it was just really interesting and neat the way he paraphrased it. So I'm going to just put this before you and just read through this a little bit. He says it this way, servants respectfully obey your earthly masters, but always with an eye to obeying the real master, Christ. I thought that was good. Like, I, I, I get it that, you know, work is work, right? It, it's, 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 sometimes it's hard and it, it's, it's, it's life sapping sometimes and you're like, oh my goodness. But he says, hey, you know what? Just respectfully obey your earthly masters, but with an eye to obeying the real master, Christ. Don't just do what you have to do to get by, but work heartily, right? But work heartily as Christ's servants doing what God wants you to do. This is great. And work with a smile on your face. Even if you have to paint it on there, I don't know. Like, even if it's a rough day, work with a smile on your face. Always keeping in mind that no matter who happens to be giving the orders, you're really serving God. I like this. Good work will get you good pay from the master. Like, I know they'll take this and, like, you know, walk up to your boss tomorrow and say, the Bible says, like, if I do good work, you're going to give me good pay. No, the Bible says we're to be respectful and we're to be honorable and we're to be honest and that ultimately the real master will reward us, right? That's what it says. So good work will get you good pay from the master regardless of whether you are slave or free. Masters, it's the same for you. No abuse, please, and no threats. You and your servants are both under the same master in heaven, He makes no distinction between you and them. Matter of fact, if I were to be really honest, when you look at the way Scripture lays out and, and, and kind of the responsibility load that God places on those that are over others, if you're an employer, I think you're gonna stand before God and probably answer for a bit more. Not, not, just, not just because that's your position, but what that entails as you oversee other people and you guide other people, that he's, he's gonna call us into question as to how did you do that? How well did you do that? So we're gonna wrap up this morning 
But I believe this next statement is probably true for a majority of us. There's some of you guys that are like, no, this doesn't apply to me. I've moved on from that phase and that stage of my life. But for a majority of us, I think this probably, probably rings true. The world doesn't see you at church. They see you at work. Again, this is the easiest day and the easiest place to be a Christian, but the world doesn't see you here. And I'm not saying what you do here doesn't matter. It matters, but it should matter as you approach tomorrow. It should matter as you step into Monday, right? So let's work at our work with all our heart, knowing that we are ultimately working for our Lord. And let's work in a matter that God's love and God's grace can be clearly seen in us and through us. Just think about this for a second, you guys. Your work environment, and some of you are students, so I'm gonna let you know this applies to you too because your school environment is where you're doing some work. That is probably your most consistent mission field. Did you know that? That's your most consistent mission field. That's where God has placed you to live out your faith. Like, we do it here corporately on Sunday, and that's great, but this is huddle, this is, hey, let's get together and, 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 and encourage each other because tomorrow we got to go to work, right? But that's probably your most consistent mission field is your place of employment. The way you work and your attitude toward your work as well as those you work with is one of your greatest opportunities to live out your faith and influence others with the gospel. You're probably not going to have a tremendous influence with the gospel here. Because the people you're sitting next to, most of them are saved. Most of them have already believed on Jesus. They've already embraced the gospel. Most we still encourage, and there's others, there's people coming to Christ. I get it. I'm not I'm not ruling that out. But for the most part, the world isn't watching you here. And you've been called to go. Not come and sit in a huddle and stay, but to go. And I'm 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 want to encourage you. You don't have to go on the other side of the world to be an evangelist. You just need to show up tomorrow and work hard. And be respectful, and be humble, and be honest. Let me ask you this. Do you see your work and approach your work as an opportunity for God's kingdom advancement and not just self-advancement? Like, do you, do you see your work that way? Do you approach your work that way? That I've, I've been put in a place, I've been surrounded by these people to see God's kingdom advanced in this place. For all my uh, retired friends this morning, there's no retirement from God's kingdom work. It doesn't exist. Not in my, at least I haven't found it. Maybe you have a different Bible. But I, I, he continues to send us into his mission field, whatever that is. I, and I'm, I, I, and I, I, I love it. I love that we have some retired folks in our, in our congregation that haven't retired from sharing the love and the grace and the goodness of God. That's awesome. Keep doing that. Wherever God takes you, wherever he lands you, find some things to fill your time with, right? We've got some people that volunteer, that do all kinds of great stuff, opportunities for God's kingdom to still advance through those things. Here's a challenge for us this week. How do your attitudes and actions at work, at school, point others to Jesus? What would others know about Jesus by watching you and listening to you? What would they know? Because here's the thing, you guys. Unbelievers typically don't read the Bible. They read you. Unbelievers typically won't listen to a sermon. They'll listen to you. So how would they know and why should they know Jesus based on what they hear and what they see in you? I just want us to be encouraged with that, that, hey, I want you to see purpose, and I want you to see God's plan, and I want you to see a call to the mission field when you step into your work environments. I don't want you to see it as, here's my work life, and here's my faith life, and here's my family life. In God's eyes, it's all life, and how do we advance God's kingdom, and how do we share his love, and how do we display his grace in all of those environments? Because ultimately, we'll answer for all of them. Like, how does this work? How are people being drawn to the gospel because of the way I conduct myself in my work environment or in my home or in my marriage? All these things that Paul's been walking us through over the last several weeks, right? It's about God's grace to you 
and about God's grace through you. How is that happening in all of these areas of relationship, in all of these areas that we move and life happens? I said this last week, and I, I just want to encourage you. you. You can't give, right? We're talking about God's grace to us and God's grace through us. You can't give what you don't have. And so this morning, we're going we're gonna to wrap up, but I want to invite you to understand and to know the grace of God in a way maybe you've never known before. Maybe it, it sounds good, you've thought about it, but you've never actually received Christ into your life and allowed his love and his grace to really take effect on you and in you and ultimately through you. I want to encourage you, that's, that's what God wants more than anything else for you this morning. Like, you can show up tomorrow and like, try to do all these things. Like, if you're an unbeliever, like, you can, I think it's a good idea, even if you're not a believer in Jesus, like, you should just show up and be humble and be honorable and be honest and be respectful. I mean, those are good things. But ultimately, there's a bigger picture here. And, and, and it's about not only being those kinds of people to the people around us, but it's about trying to show Jesus to the people around us. Why? So that they will one day know Jesus. That's what we're called to. That's what we're asked of. And I would encourage you this morning, if you don't know Christ, opportunity right now. We're going to pray in just a second. You can pray silently. You can pray along with me if you want to accept Christ into your heart and to begin that new relationship of, of realizing God's goodness and God's grace in your life and then being a conduit of God's grace through your life. And I'm going to tell you, there's no better life. I, I'll be honest with you. Brother Scott talked about this in our, in our um, growth group this morning about God not only came to just save us, but he came to give us an abundant life. That abundant life has everything to do with God's grace in us and God's grace through us. It really has nothing to do with a lot of the external stuff that we, we get all kind of wrapped up about. It's about what is our life doing and who are we influencing and who are we impacting for the kingdom, right? I don't know about you guys, one of my, my, my most vivid dreams that I, that I have from time to time that I just, I don't want to wake up from is one day being able to stand before Christ and being surrounded by people that had an opportunity to deposit God's grace and the gospel into. I don't, not for my own reward, but that we can all worship the king together. That one day we can stand and just praise the one that's, that's worthy of all praise and all honor. And, and maybe... I encourage you to maybe start seeing your work environments as a place for God to use you in that capacity. Let me pray for you. And maybe you need to pray silently as well. Father God, we're so grateful that your grace to us is absolutely amazing. We talked about, we sang about your love this morning. We sang about your greatness. But God, help this be more than just words on our lips, but help this be the innermost belief an innermost convict, convictment and, or, or convincing and, and, con, and, and conviction of our hearts. Help this be something more than just, hey, we show up on a Sunday and we say some words and we, we answer some questions and we sing some songs. But God, let this be you moving us and stirring us to understand that your mission really exists in a large way outside the walls of this place. That you've called us here together today to worship to be encouraged, but God, tomorrow's Monday, and a new week starts, and how do we take what we're hearing and, and thinking and maybe even believing today, how does that affect us tomorrow? God, I pray that, uh, that we'll see that as a, as a mission field, as a field that's ripened to harvest, and you've just asked us to go and be workers in your field. God, I pray this morning specifically, if there's somebody here that hasn't accepted your son, that religion seems like an interesting idea, but I don't know about this faith in Jesus, that today they would come to know your son as their savior and realize that you sent him to pay the ultimate price for us so that we can step into an eternal relationship with a God that wants nothing more than an eternal relationship with us. And that only happens through belief, through faith. There's nothing else. There's no hoops to jump through. Simple faith in the gospel that Jesus came, he lived, he died according to the scriptures, he was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures that he did exactly what the scriptures tell us he did for us. And I pray today that maybe they would surrender their hearts to you, you would become their savior. And for the balance of us, God, that have made that decision, help us understand that you want to be more than just our rescuer and just our savior. You're our Lord. And so in that, would you allow us Help us to allow you to shape us, to challenge us, to stretch us, to help us see that there's others 
that need to know you and that we just continue to know you better. And we just pray all this in Jesus' name.